Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to this today's event uh, for infrastructure for climate resilience. This is a virtual event that is co-organized by the Climate Investment Fund, the World Bank, and the Asian Development Bank. I would just like to remind everybody that the event is being recorded. And we would also like uh, to encourage participants to provide their questions and feedback in the chat box during the event. My name is Noelle O'Brien and I work with the Asian Development Bank. Uh, for the last three years, I've been the principal climate change specialist for the Pacific. And I'll soon be working as ADB's director of climate change. I'm pleased to be here today with colleagues from the uh, ADB, also from the Climate Investment Fund and the World Bank. Just to introduce the topic uh, for today's event, uh, while progress continues with making newly planned infrastructure climate resilient, there is an increasing rec recognition of the need to scale up investment in infrastructure aimed at building climate resilience of pirate communities, economy, sector, and the environment. It's our view that a transformative approach to adaptation and resilience requires a resilience centric as opposed to infrastructure first approach to infrastructure planning, design, and financing. The type of infrastructure is determined by the most effective and efficient way to reduce the impacts of current and future risks and or address barriers for adaptation and resilience. This, uh, these types of investments are quite diverse. It might be uh, to invest in solar powered small scale irrigation schemes that would support farmers in drought prone areas to cope with even drier, drier climates. It might be to adopt nature-based solutions, such as restoring salt marshes, mudflats, or peat bogs to control flooding. It might take the form of introducing policy instruments that discourage investments in high-risk areas, or it might be to develop and deploy extreme weather warning systems. Uh, the objective of this event organized by CIF, ADB, and the World Bank is to address the question of what it takes to shift the focus of infrastructure investment with resilience as the primary goal. This is uh, what, what we're going to do today is we're going to unpack some of the key elements for scaling up investment in infrastructure designed to build climate resilience, uh, policy and planning processes, finance, and knowledge support. During this event, speakers and participants will provide responses uh, on a number of questions. Uh, so they, these questions are, what are the MDBs doing to generate credible and actionable climate and disaster risk information for the planning and design of resilient infrastructure planning? What are the key opportunities and good practices to ensure climate resilient programming? How can we address analytical challenges, preventing finance for resilient infrastructure? And how can adaptation and disaster risk management principles be integrated into priority programs with particular reference to infrastructure? So today I'm joined by some very knowledgeable speakers. Um, we have Lori Rufo from the Climate and from SIP. Lori is a climate change specialist at, at the Climate Investment Fund, uh, leading its climate adaptation portfolio under the pilot program for climate resilience. Uh, prior to joining SIF, Lori worked uh, as a senior climate change officer at the ADB. We're also joined by Dr. Shan Fu Lu, who is a senior strategy and outreach specialist with the Climate Investment Fund's administrative unit. Um, and where there's a focus on adaptation and climate resilience. Shan Fu trained as an applied meteorologist and has been working on climate risk assessment and management for over 20 years. Her work spans climate science, climate resilience practices, and the international policy on adaptation. My colleague, Alexandra Galperin from the World Bank has 30 years of experience in disaster risk management before joining ADB's Pacific Regional Department, 
Alexandra worked for the Red Cross, UNDP, and as a consultant for multiple technical, donor, humanitarian, and development organizations, balancing a combination of headquarter and field assignments. Uh, since joining um, ADB in April 2020, Alexandra has been leading DRM investment operations in the Pacific Department. Swarna Kazi from the World Bank is also joining us. Swarna is a senior disaster risk management specialist at the World Bank and the Bangladesh focal point for the Global Facility for Disaster Reduction and Recovery. Swarna is, respons is responsible for strengthening country partnerships, managing the policy dialogue, leading operations and analytics to advance the disaster risk management and climate change agenda. Nishna Krishnan uh, from WRI is a senior climate finance associate within the climate resilience practice and currently serves as the director of the Systemic Resilience Forum of the Coalition for Climate Resilient Investment. Her work focuses on advancing the integration of climate risks, adaptation, and resilience con considerations into public and private decision-making processes, from supporting central ministries of finance, economies, and planning to private investors and companies. John Katongo Banda from Zambia is a development planner with over 18 years experience in mainstreaming cross-cutting issues such as climate change, gender, HIV and AIDS, and human rights into plans, programs, and projects. John is currently working as the environmental and social inclusion specialist for the pilot program for climate resilience in Zambia and the transforming landscapes for resilience and development projects. So welcome to our speakers. Uh, our, our, our final words today will be from Shi Hong Sheng, who has more from the World Bank. He has more than 25 years experience in managing climate funds and projects at the World Bank and UN agencies. And he's currently leading efforts to establish a results-based climate finance facility at the World Bank to scale up climate action in developing countries. He also serves as the World Bank's focal point for climate investment funds for their pilot program for climate resilience. So, so welcome everybody to today's panel. Uh, At this point, I would like to bring my uh, colleague Amel in uh, to run through a small icebreaker uh, with a number of questions for you. Over to you, Amel. Hi, thank you. Thank you so much, Noel. Uh, welcome. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good everyone. Um, everyone. Welcome to this event. Um, as a beginning, we wanted to start the event by asking you a few questions to get to know more about you and more about the audience attending this event. Um, we would use Slido for this section. So if you can um, see on this, um, on this slide here, the instruction to go to Slido, uh, you can either go through your um, uh, internet browser or if you already have the Slido app, um, please enter the code um, to access to this specific poll. Uh, for those who would uh, who have um, uh, uh, devices, more devices, I will also show in up the QR code for the poll shortly. So kind of showing multiple ways to access this poll um, so that we can start soon. So let me, with that, let me stop sharing the, the PPT and I will start sharing Slido. And I already see that some of you have already accessed and started already uh, responding to the first question uh, that went already went live. So let me share my screen. Okay. Um, Alexandra, can, uh, uh, I know I can see my screen. 
Yes, we can. So the first question would be, what country are you from? And then we see that we started already having uh, responses on um, on uh, on the poll. So please, if you can fill in, um, provide your information. If you are in a country from a country and also now located in another, that's also fine. I uh, would like to kind of have as much information as we we can from the audience today. Uh, we'll give. One minute before we move on to the next question. And we see that the majority are for the United States, but we also see um, like a good spread of countries, UK, Jamaica, Ireland, Zambia, Italy, China, Paraguay different regions presented, which is a good thing. Okay, responses are still coming. Greece, okay. India, Romania, Bangladesh, I think we have a few people from Bangladesh. Okay, I think we have received responses from everyone. So yeah, thank you for addressing, which is a, an interesting spread and in, of of countries. So uh, with that, let's move on to the next question to kind of understand, kind of dive in a little bit more on the topic of of the of the session today. And we would like to know what climate threats are you worried about? Um, please feel free to enter more than one uh, response because we understand that is everybody's having several several threats and several things that we worry about, especially um, as we work on climate change and climate um, and adaptation and, and also resilience. So, okay, flooding, droughts, and again, there is no limit in terms of how many an um, answers you provide. So please feel free to enter as many. And again, I understand that the responses may be endless with, with climate threats. So cyclone sea level rise, wildfires, storms, Extreme rainfall. Yeah. Pollution is, of course, food insecurity. Extreme events, which I assume would summarize multiple answers that we have here. Um, landslides. Yeah. And I, all of them are like accurate in questions and something that would um, be relevant to also the subject as well. Okay, we'll give it 30 seconds to receive a few more responses before we move on to the next question. And it's actually interesting because uh, the next question would be more of how, what would be your role in facing this? So. Um, having as many as many responses on this, but I'm more now intrigued to see what would be the responses to the next one. Um, so let's move on to the next question. And so, and this is a, as a follow up to the previous one of how will you contribute to avoid these climate threats that were mentioned in the previous in the previous uh, poll? So, and again. Responses are, um, there is no limit in terms of number of responses. And we understand that actions are limitless, but please feel free. And, and it can be from a personal perspective or also from uh, your role in terms of um, your, the, your work that you're doing in your respective organization and also in the, in the climate finance architecture. So again.
Yeah. Net zero plans, reduce waste, eliminate plastic, reuse repair recycle, less flying, definitely. And I feel like uh, the pandemic uh, has slowed that down, but definitely is something that we need to consider on, on the long term as well. Afforestation, adaptation solution. And again, I, we, I don't believe that would be kind of a, the number of questions, especially as now most of the people that are here are people in this, um, in the in, in the development um, world. So I feel like the effort that we can do are, are, are endless. And again, it can be from our personal and our professional perspective. So with that, um, let me use this opportunity to give the floor back to, to, to Noel um, so that we go back to the session and also um, interesting to have these, this perspective before we move on to the subject of, of the discussion today. Uh, Noel, let me give it back to you as I transition back to the presentation. Okay, thanks very much, Amel. And, and great to see such a wide span of participants. I think we're all the way around the globe from the US through uh, other countries in Europe, India, Southeast Asia, the Philippines. So, so welcome everybody. And I think we've got a really broad span of uh, climate change issues that people are worried about. Everything from flooding, droughts, extreme rainfall, sea level rise, wildfires, etc. And then all of the kinds of actions that you su suggested, everything from uh, your individual actions right through to strategic um, engagement. And I think that's a good entry point for the conversation that we're here to have today. So I'm delighted now to be able to hand over to Lori and Shan Fu from the SIF. They're going to highlight findings from the SIF knowledge brief on infrastructure projects underlining the examples of investment in infrastructure for resilience and associated implementation lessons and good practices. So Laurie Shanfu, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Noel. Um, good, good day, good evening, everyone. Um, I am Laurie Rufo from the Climate Investment Funds. So before we dive in into our presentation on the findings of uh, our report, let me provide you a brief background of the pilot program for climate resilience. Um, so the pilot program for climate resilience or PPCR is a dedicated program of the Climate Investment Funds on adaptation. It has a total resources of uh, 1.2 billion. The program supports developing countries and regions to improve capacity and implement programs and projects to building resilience to the impacts of climate change. So these slides uh, shows us the global reach of the PPCR. There are 28 countries participating in the program and also two regional programs um, as provided in this slide. Next slide, please, Amel. So on this slide, uh, what I would like to highlight is the unique characteristics of uh, PPCR programming and implementation. So PPCR is designed uh, to be a learning laboratory uh, to test out unique approaches to adapting to climate change and building resilience across uh, sector and communities. The program is a country-led initiative. So each country uh, pro, um, promotes and adopts a programmatic approach uh, to uh, identifying um, priority projects on adaptation and resilience building. It starts with a country diagnostic to identify specific climate risks and vulnerabilities to inform the preparation of the investment plan and also prioritization of projects for implementation. The financing support to countries are provided at scale. The highest country allocation under PPCR is about 100 million, and this is co-financed by MDBs with their own resources and from other sources like the private sector. The identification of adaptation priorities involves a participatory and inclusive process. So we bring in the relevant stakeholders on the table from the national to the local level, including communities and vulnerable groups. 
So with PPCR as a learning laboratory, we have developed a series of knowledge briefs and organized events under our SIFS Knowledge for Resilience series. This is to share the knowledge and lessons in implementing PPCR programs and projects. And so today, uh, we are officially launching the latest from our Knowledge for Resilience series. The knowledge brief is titled, Investing in Infrastructure for a Changing Climate, Results and Lessons Learned from the PPCR. The knowledge brief draws from lessons and good practices from a portfolio of uh, PPCR projects which have significant investments in infrastructure. It provides useful insights on how infrastructure investments could serve as an instrument to drive resilience in sectors and communities. And with this knowledge product, we also um, aim to offer potential solutions to recover from COVID-19 in ways that are sustainable, inclusive, and resilient, and do this through investments in climate resilient infrastructure. Now I hand it over to Shen Fu to present the summary of the report and set the scene for our topic today and how we can develop resilience centric infrastructure investments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laurie. Um, I got a bit of uh, echo here. Um, so um, as Laurie said, we uh, look at this um, almost a 700 million um, portfolio for projects under the PPCR, um, focusing on either exclusively or partially on infrastructure. And it covers um, uh, multiple sectors, um, you know, water, energy, transport, agriculture, natural resources, and so on. And it also um, uh, takes the uh, integrated and the very outcome-oriented approach to re resilience building. I'll come back to this point uh, a moment later. Um, with um, a comprehensive set of support, including the upstream engagement to really uh, building the uh, uh, prerequisite for climate resilience infrastructure development. And that could include things like uh, develop or update existing design guidance and, and the standards, um, to carry out uh, um, risk assessment to identify the uh, vulnerability hotspots in order to have more targeted investment and then we invest in um, strategic pieces of infrastructure and um, or upgrade the existing uh, ones and uh, in on top of that um, we also um, very much focus the downstream support once the infrastructure is put in place um, provisions need to be made to uh, provide the continuous technical and the institutional capacity support so that the infrastructure put in place are properly uh, maintained and, and operative um, so that they continue to provide the intended benefits. Next, please. So we, um, we look at this um, portfolio of projects and we identified um, some high level, um, um, what we call the lessons. Um, in terms of the project the design and, and the implementation or general engagement. So these are the, um, uh, the main um, lessons emerged uh, as we look deep into these projects. The first point is really to highlight the importance of stakeholder engagement. And this will not only ensure that um, whatever we invest is actually what, what the beneficiary communities really um, need, and also they can be part of the um, part of the solution in terms of identify what's needed and how to deliver it. And um, so that um, the benefits can be sustained over a longer period of time beyond the project life cycle, um, the project lifetime itself. And then secondly, um, we can't really um, under, um, emphasize enough the importance of data and the information um, it's like we um, have this COVID experience. If we don't have data information, it's very difficult to say how we can really effectively address the problem. And um, so the same thing here goes here. How do we design projects to um, make sure they are um, climate or future proof 
and um, and where to invest and 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 by how much. So this is a essential part, integral part of the planning process. And then uh, finance, um, as we know, in um, low medium income countries, there is a huge gap in terms of financing um, infrastructure development. And um, and 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 the um, public finance uh, is not going to be sufficient. So private sector engagement is absolutely essential, including the resources. Um, but how to mobilize that? Um, and uh, typically in developing countries, in, in terms of financing climate fi climate resilience um, and more broadly climate action, they see. Um, very well documented set of barriers, including the information asymmetry. This just doesn't have enough information in those uh, relatively underdeveloped markets. And then the business models sometimes are less developed and the people just don't see the benefits we invest in. And finally, of course, the perceived high level of risks in investing in these markets. And uh, so the uh, safe finance um, characterized as very highly, highly concessional finance, if they are strategically um, deployed, they can address some of these risks and, and, and remove the barriers. Um, and uh, finally, flexibility is very important in um, uh, implementing uh, projects in developing countries. So as we say, the COVID situation, once the lockdown comes in, a lot of the implementation project implementations need to be reconsidered and adjusted to the you know, real challenging uh, realities on the ground. So um, again, in the project the design, some flexibility needs to be built in to address the sort of emerging situations on the ground. We can't just uh, set in stone a few years ahead and then uh, nothing will be changed to jeopardize the um, outcome. Next slide, please. Um, so moving forward, how do we do that? We look at the, um, what has done, what has been done, what has achieved, and we um, want to move forward to see how to take this work, work forward. So the you know, first point we uh, want to highlight is uh, very important to take a human-centric approach. Um, it's fine, we invest in infrastructure, we want to improve the um, general service level, but uh, at the end of the day, it's the people who we want to help. And how do we do that? That needs to be really part of the um, the whole planning process and uh, their benefits and their, um, uh, the challenges need to really be the guiding um, factor in, in design um, investments. And the second part uh, point is the um, the standards and and the, and the um, principles. So we can do as much uh, project by project level to help design the specific piece of infrastructure, but how do we make this more systematic? And uh, at a scale, we need standards. And uh, thirdly, um, we again highlight the importance of knowledge um, and the data analytics. And this is again an area of huge um, need to improve and uh, uh, universities and the academic institutions will have a bigger role to play here. And again, partnership will be essential to make this happen. And finally, we need to scale up investment. We don't have enough resources to, um, yeah, to, to um, develop and deliver the um, very basic line, so infrastructure, let alone climate resilient and sustainable. And um, so we have the pandemic, the national economies have been um, very severely scarred, so the challenge is even more acute. But it also provides a, um, a great opportunity with all these stimulus packages being announced can be a very good opportunity to really promote the um, resilience uh, outcome in this uh, delivering the recovery package. And the analysis carried out uh, recently are uh, looking at just the two, around the two billion, sorry, two trillion um, the stimulus package being announced by various governments. It's hardly 18% uh, of this can be considered as green um, even much less, let's say, uh, targeting climate resilience. So there is a very long way to go, but there's also huge scope for um, for improvement. Thank you very much. I will stop here. Back to you, Noel. Thank you, Noel.
we're in the same room, so we need to coordinate our muting. Mute. I, I have an echo. Thanks very much. Okay. Um, so I think uh, thanks very much to Laurie and Chan Fu for that summary of the pilot uh, uh, program for climate resilience. I think a lot of very uh, important um, guidance emerging from that process. And I think that's an excellent point to hand over to uh, my colleague, Alexandra Galperin. Um, and Alexandra is going to talk about risk-informed planning um, and specifically focusing, focusing on what ADB is doing to generate credible and actionable climate and disaster risk information for the planning on design of resilient infrastructure systems in the Pacific. Alexandra, over to you. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Noel. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. Um, I will pick up um, from Shan Fu's from one of Shan Fu's key lessons of the importance of data and analytics and highlight a cl recent climate and disaster risk assessment undertaken by the government of Tonga and ADB to create the necessary climate risk information for resilience centric infrastructure in Tonga, uh, Tonga Tapu. Um, before showing you a video in which our Tonga government counterparts reflect on the assessment, let me briefly introduce the background to the multi-hazard disaster risk assessment and ADB's rationale to take on this work. It is literally fresh off the press. Uh, we have concluded this work in May. Um, the uh, government of Tonga adopted uh, the results of the risk assessment in August, and we've just been given the permission to share this publicly, including this video. Um, as you can see on this slide, uh, ADB has a significant concentration of infrastructure investments in and near the uh, capital of Tonga, which is Nukalofa on the island of Tonga Tapu, which is low lying and highly flood prone. Um, in the context of an urban resilience sector project in 2018, uh, ADB conducted a feasibility study that concluded that the significant flooding risks could not be managed through structural interventions such as drainage or seawalls. Um, since the government also showed a considerable interest in gaining a clearer picture of climate and disaster risks on the island of Tonga Tapu, to guide adaptation efforts, the risk assessment was commissioned. Next slide, please. Uh, so the uh, multi-hazard disaster risk assessment aimed to establish longer term and holistic horizon of risk information for transformational adaptation planning and supportive investments rather than focusing on project focused disaster or climate proofing or individual structural interventions to reduce hazard risks. Um, what we also did was to combine um, in the risk assessment a focus on geophysical and weather related hazards and uh, integrated um, climate change scenarios systematically into the analysis of the various inundation hazards, while also looking at sea level rise as a hazard of its own. And next slide, please. Um, this slide uh, illustrates the scope and the progression of the disaster risk assessment. So we're starting with the hazard assessment uh, on the left, and you can see what was covered. Storm surge, um, pluvial flooding, tsunami, sea level rise, earthquake, and strong winds in relation to tropical cyclones. Then um, the, we looked at assets exposed, um, and these included uh, the building stocks or all buildings, um, uh, energy, the water, and the transport sector, in addition to people, of course. And this was followed by the vulnerability assessment for all assets, resulting in the final risk assessment, uh, uh, which means the estimation of losses. Um, the final risk assessment was broken down at the level of the smallest uh, 
administrative units, uh, which is towns for the entire island of Tonga Tapu. Um, risks to these towns can be appreciated per individual hazards, as well as combined hazards. Results also reflect risks per sector and can be broken down to the asset level, individual asset level within sectors. Um, let's start the video, please. The Kingdom of Tonga, a country with over 3,000 years of history, is positioned at the southernmost group in the Polynesian Islands. Because of its position in the South Pacific and its low-lying geography, Tonga is one of the most disaster-prone countries in the world, ranking second of 181 countries on the World Disaster Risk Index in 2020. Earthquakes, tsunamis, floods and cyclones are a constant threat in Tonga and with climate change, cyclones and flooding are becoming less predictable and more intense. In 2020, the government of Tonga and ADB commissioned a multi-hazard climate and disaster risk assessment covering the island of Tongatapo in order to identify both high and low risk areas and communities. And uh, this study providing the opportunity uh, of this uh, important assessment uh, of where we are, the situations, and giving us some solid scientific evidence of these uh, impacts of climate change. A database was developed, of course, to quantify and distribution in the characteristics of uh, assets and uh, population across the island. Based on international, regional, national data sets and field observation, the assessment analyzed 28,000 buildings. 1,200 kilometers of roads, 26,000 power and 500 water assets across the entire island, including the capital. These assets were plotted against earthquakes, windstorms, tsunamis, rain fed, and coastal flooding hazards to model the impact of natural hazards with and without climate change. The assessment finalized in May 2021 identified climate and disaster risks to assets and population across Dongatapu expressed as annual average losses. Dongatapu is the most densely populated area of Dongatapu and it's situated between two bodies of water. It's also the fifth lowest lying city in the world at only 1.5 meters above sea level. When you combine these factors, plus underlying poor drainage and continual development, it is very important for us to understand how to manage low risk planning for the future. The assessment applied various climate change scenarios, namely sea level rise and extreme rainfall events against different levels and likelihoods of flooding. Results were broken down at the level of individual towns, which are the basic administrative units in Tonga. A risk index was established ranking these towns against individual and I think we're almost at the end so, of the video. Yes, maybe Alexandra, um, you can give a short summary of, of the video. Risk okay. Okay. It's of great value to Tonga. By helping us plan with low risk, we can ensure the long-term security of our assets and the safety of our populations. By identifying the high risk, we are able to look at a new way as to when and where to locate our future assets so that we can ensure that we plan for the sustainable development and future growth of the Kingdom of Tonga. The information allows to design the gradual development of safer areas and steering investments away from the highest risk areas while ensuring that all investments are designed and operated to withstand multiple hazards. And this includes using post-disaster situations and recovery to not only build back better in a manner resilient to natural hazards, but to promote rebuilding away from high-risk locations for a safer and resilient Tonga 
in the 21st century. Alexander, are you still there? Yes, I'm here. I think we're, we're switching to the next speaker now. Okay, I, okay, thank you. Um, okay, uh, just uh, from, from that work in Tonga, just to let you know that um, the video and the associated report with it will be coming up on ADB's website at the end of next week. Um, and so uh, please do access them. And uh, we look forward to um, hearing your views on that work. I'm really pleased now to welcome uh, Swarna Kazi of the World Bank. Uh, the title of this is Resilience Programming. And Swarna will be focusing on a questions around the key opportunities and good practices to ensure climate resilience programming. So welcome, Swarna. Uh, thank you and uh, good day to all. Um, delighted to be here today. Uh, I'll highlight opportunities and good practices for climate resilience programming, design and delivery. And I'll be showcasing the experience from the implementation of the Bangladesh Coastal Embankment Improvement Project, which is a $400 million project that includes $25 million of a climate investment funds from the Pilot Program for Climate Resilience, PPCR grants. So when flying along the coast of Bangladesh, you'll see a vast Delta landscape. It's crisscrossed by rivers and paddy fields. However, this may mask the magnitude of disaster risks faced by the country in terms of hazards, exposure, and vulnerability. Next, please. Bangladesh is exposed to cyclones, storm surges, floods, landslides, and it sits on the front lines in the battle against climate change as one of the most climate vulnerable countries in the world. It's a nation of 165 million and also among the world's most densely populated. Bangladesh is ranked number one in vulnerability to tropical cyclones in the world with an average of one severe tropical cyclone every three years. Next, please. However, despite these challenges, Bangladesh is a story of resilience. In 1970, Cyclone Bola, the world's deadliest tropical cyclone on record, made landfall and devastated the coastline. According to official estimates, the cyclone resulted in over 300,000 lives lost. Next, please. Fast forward 50 years, cyclones of comparable intensity resulted in around 3,000 lives lost fatalities having declined a hundredfold. This remarkable progress is the result of integrated and systematic investments in climate resilience over the last decades. Protecting lives, livelihoods, and assets from disasters have been central to Bangladesh's development strategy. And key to this has been through an integrated approach. This includes policies, plans, acts, um, institutional strengthening, hydromet and meteorological advancements and forecasting, preparedness initiatives and community-based early warning systems, and all of this integrated with large-scale infrastructure systems. And of course, analytics for resilience through learning and knowledge. For example, resilient design standards have further enhanced infrastructure investments. Next, please. Investments such as this multi-purpose disaster shelter project, this is constructing and rehabilitating thousands of shelters. These disaster shelters are multi-purpose in a simple yet innovative way. Throughout the year, they serve as schools, and then during disasters, they become safe havens. This is closely integrated with the long-standing Cyclone Preparedness Program, which is a volunteer community-based early warning initiative. With past learnings, designs have evolved over time, and now including more systematically inclusive and gender-sensitive approaches. Next, please. Investments such as the Coastal Embankment Improvement Project, it aims to protect vulnerable coastal areas. It helps safeguard against tidal floods, cyclones, storm surges, salinity intrusion, coastal erosion in the context of the changing climate scenarios. Next, please. 
works include upgradation of embankments, construction and rehabilitation of hydraulic structures and associated drainage infrastructures. These designs being based on climate projections. Next, please. This project, it's also integrating nature-based solutions initiative through the afforestation component, which embeds social forestry. This engages the local communities to ensure benefit sharing as part of an overall integrated protection program. So planting mangroves and other saline tolerant species, the project establishes an added layer of protection by reducing the impact of tidal flooding and the storm surge. These species, they're carefully selected considering the location, the level of protection and the co-benefits to the local community. Next, please. So finally, the project, it's expected to also result in increased agricultural productivity, food security, creation of jobs, and all of this is part of a comprehensive resilience strategy. Next, please. In-depth analytics are undertaken to better understand the large-scale dynamics of the Delta to inform the coastal resilience approach. The activities include data analysis, modeling, consultations, knowledge exchange, and all of this overarching aim is to better design uh, future investments along the coast. So I'll be covering three analytics with some of the key takeaways. First, as you see here, was developing concept design solutions for coastal erosion. Erosion of riverbanks and the coast, it's an increasing challenge in Bangladesh. So finding a cost-effective solution for erosion, it's not safe straightforward, but it provides opportunity to leverage multifunctionality and also the use of nature-based solutions. So one such innovative and integrative solution is shown. Through building with nature concept, this multifunctional embankment in combination with a groin field and sediment nourishment are proposed to combat coastal erosion, while also enhancing flood protection and developing tourism and other economic activities. Similar concept design solutions can be used in, in other coastal zones of other countries. Next, please. The next analytics touches upon uh, mapping of mangrove opportunities. So mangroves can, off, can help prevent erosion and reduce wave attack by dampening the wave energy but not all locations are suitable for mangroves. So using open data, a method has been developed to identify potential sites that are near existing mangrove patches of the coastal zone. So here are some of the sites with high restoration potential that are depicted on this map. So similarly, you can also identify mangrove opportunities, uh, combining them with coastal protection investments for other at-risk coastlines. So overall, a few takeaways are as follows. Interventions many times focus on three of the five pillars of an strategic investment agenda. Next, please. Uh, and uh, the protection may be through an integrated polder system, including embankments and associated structures, impact reduction through shelters and early warning, uh, residual risk reduction through community-based programs and support to livelihoods. While these are critical and must not be neglected, Looking forward, there are other opportunities. So hazard reduction by working more with nature and seeking more nature-based solutions, more integrated risk-based and probabilistic approach in design of systems, a comprehensive risk framework to enhance the systematic planning, design and maintenance of the coastal measures to reduce risk, and then also better linking spatial planning of economic activities in the coastal zone, including thinking about to what level these activities must be protected against coastal threats. Next, please. So the ultimate proof of all these investments in analytics is in its application, its practical application and support to the people to improve their life and boost their prosperity. This is universal for Bangladesh and for all countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Swarna. And I think uh, really a lot of uh, synergies between the two approaches to the work in Bangladesh and in Tonga. And, and so great that we have this opportunity to share today. Um, our next speaker is with uh, World Resources Institute, uh, Nisha Krishnan, uh, who's gonna talk to us about financing for resilience. 
uh, specifically Nisha will focus in on how we uh, can address analytical challenges preventing finance for resilient infrastructure. And Nisha will reflect on financing and investment opportunities. So welcome, Nisha. Thanks very much, Noel. Um, and thank you very much for the opportunity to, to talk to you today about sort of, I think we've already heard about analytical and data challenges for um, assessments, but also for financing. And uh, next, first slide, please, or next slide, thank you. Um, I wanted to take a step back uh, and sort of, sort of expand on the point that Jian Fu made earlier on and the fact that private finance is hard to come by for resilience, but so is public finance. And one of the things that we have found through the, our work is that first, physical climate risks, so our floods of the day, hazards, um, storms, and others are very much financially material and that there is a, an opportunity and an imperative for both public and private investors to actually address this. And second is that these risks are actually mispriced, as in we are not actually taking them into account. And so we don't actually know the full cost of what climate change is imposing on us. But secondly, on the flip side, investors, whether private, uh, private investors or even the government and public investors are actually not yet rewarded for investing resiliently. And by that, I mean that they do not see a uh, change in, say, their interest rate or their cost of capital when they borrow to make more resilient infrastructure. Uh, they do not see any sort of change in terms of financing or whether they have um, sort of guarantees or uh, lower uh, or longer payment rates, even though there might be actual rewards for investing resiliently and reducing risks ex ante. Next slide, please. So through the work on the Coalition for Climate Resilient Investments, I'm sorry, this slide is slightly hard to see. We are actually trying to address the analytical challenges that are behind actually understanding what the investment opportunities for resilience are. And the challenges happen at three different levels. I think we've started to hear a little bit more about the systemic piece around how national assessments and related decisions can actually include physical climate change. Um, the second piece is at the asset level. So how would you actually understand at the bridge level how these individual investments can actually include physical climate change, right? So how might we actually structure uh, and design the, the engineering piece of it? How might we include nature-based solutions and value the benefits of these um, better into this individual asset? And then how would we change even the things like cost benefit analysis, which are actually the fundamental pieces that would go into deciding whether this opportunity is something that we invest in or not. And the third piece is obviously finance, right? So on the financial level, how can we actually direct capital, both public and private, in a way that is guided by the good integration or better integration of physical climate risks in our uh, design. So at the systemic level, one thing that we've been working with actually uh, is with the government in Jamaica and the, this tool will be released in exactly three minutes at another parallel event at the UK Pavilion, but this is called the Systemic Risk Assessment Tool. And this looks at, for example, how we might look at network-based understandings of infrastructure rather than the single asset, which I think both uh, Alexandria, Alexandra and Swarna have also mentioned. The second piece, for example, around the asset piece is around how would we actually change the cash flow um, modeling that companies as well as public investors use to understand what is a bankable project, what are the designs that they need to um, adhere to. If you could go to the next slide, we can get into the asset side of it. So. Um, one thing I, again, this is, I apologize for the small font, but one of the things that we've done with the Coalition of Climate Resilient Investment, which I should say is a coalition of more than 120 members at this point, spanning everyone from your asset, um, asset managers, so your engineering companies, your institutional investors, down to your construction companies, to public entities, both multilateral, but also national governments, and then actual credit rating agencies, right? So if you're looking at both the public side and the private side, credit rating is becoming an issue. Um, but 
through this sort of multi-partner initiative, what we've done is come up with, for example, how you might actually integrate climate risk data that we've talked about already into the engineering module, right? So how would you actually understand what are the cap increased capital expenditures in the upfront space, but also the reduction in operating expenditures going uh, uh, sort of going forward. So if you can see on the graph on the below side, the yellow is what we invest in and the little blue bar at the bottom might be what we might invest in additionally for resilience. Um, but in the flip side, when it becomes, uh, when you're operating, you actually have reduced costs over time and you might actually have the um, reduction in operating expenditures come back to you as a revenue stream. And what we've done over the last year and a half is actually prove this concept with 39 historical projects that we've actually gone into the financing for and to model to see, ex, um, I guess, obviously with hindsight, that if we had included physical climate risks into this decision making, we would actually have reduced operating costs. And this shows that there is a financing model out there for resilient infrastructure and for asset management. The second piece of this is that this obviously should affect credit quality ratings, which is what private investors really look for, um, as well as public investors. If you're going to the open market to get financing, then the credit quality of an asset um, is very important as to whether people will invest in this project or not. And so we've worked with SP, for example, the ratings agency, agency to come up with what um, actual credit quality drivers are. So what are the things that you might want to look for? And then uh, how would we actually go this, uh, do this in practice, right? So what would we need to do to implement this? And the third piece is the asset valuation piece. So practical guide, uh, we're coming up with practical guidance to investors in terms of how you might do this in practice. Um, and then thinking about how this actually affects net present value. And so this whole notion of the fact that private investment or public investment is hard to get is what we're trying to address. Um, next slide, please. This is obviously has to be coupled with the systemic piece, um, the systemic piece, which I was trying to get into. There are um, this tool that we are developing in conjunction with the government of Jamaica and that they're piloting to understand um, both the risks. So I think uh, taking a um, lesson from Alexandra as well as Swarna here, this is a dynamic investment prioritization tool that is based on the integration and the mapping of future climate risks for up to about 25 years and mapping that onto infrastructure networks for roads, for, uh, for transport, for energy, for water, um, and understanding where investments can be prioritized that would protect the most economic um, and social value. So the impacts on societies, whether that is their ability to get to schools or to their jobs and trying to maximize the protection and the investment that we make um, in their protection value. So what we've done is to come up with this dynamic tool that really looks at both the economic modeling side of it, but also the so social modeling side of it to pinpoint where there might be pieces um, there might be assets that we might want to prioritize investment and in, given their benefits to not just the economic side of it, which is where we generally are on the adaptation side, but the societal benefits. The second phase of this is actually to value nature-based solutions within this model, such that nature-based, that nature is also valued for its protection benefits. Um, so we'd be very excited to showcase this and I'm happy to send around the link to the to the next uh, session as well about, um, about this work in Jamaica and that we're hoping to actually scale up to several other countries in the coming year. Um, very quickly, just reflecting on the investment opportunities here, I think what we've realized is that the analytical challenges is not just in the planning side, but also in the financing side and um, uh, getting private investors and public investors, to be honest, even governments uh, to come to terms with the fact that um, there are sort of financial benefits, not just economic benefits to ad, uh, investing in adaptation and that, that it goes beyond sort of just generation of um, uh, sort of opportunities, but also to protect our societies and that we really need to change the cost benefit analysis uh, modules that we already have right now to actually understand and uh, derive the benefits. 
And with that, I will um, stop there because I think we're already over time. So thank you very much. Um, thanks very much, Nisha, and, and uh, really exciting to see, see this work emerging from, from Jamaica. Um, I'm aware that there's also been, I think this, this shows us just how much is evolving in this space, how quickly and um, how we all need to keep learning from each other. Um, right now, I'm going to move immediately on to our fourth presenter today. Uh, we have um, John uh, from Zambia, who's going to talk about mainstreaming resilience in sector programs. Uh, he's specifically going to talk about how uh, can adaptation and disaster risk management principles be integrated into priority programs with particular reference to uh, infrastructure. Uh, John, uh, welcome to you. Uh, thank you, Noel. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, Zambia, it is estimated that uh, uh, between 1996 and uh, 2017, uh, Zambia suffered a loss amounting to $150 million in the road sector alone uh, due to damage uh, to uh, the road infrastructure as a result of um, uh, floods. So that um, amount of loss really generated the need for us to ensure that we mainstream uh, climate change uh, in our sector policies, plans, and strategies. If we don't attend to, to that particular issue, it means we'll continue losing these amounts of money. So the starting point for us has been to ensure that we integrate climate change into policies, plans, and strategies, uh, in as much as we have an overarching uh, national policy on climate change, we've made it a point that uh, climate change is also mainstreamed in the national development plans, in the sector plans, and we've also gone to lower levels and ensuring that the district plans are also uh, integrate climate change. And we've also gone to the sub-district level, the WADs, uh, where what development plans have been developed, we've also ensured that climate change is mainstreamed at that particular level. So apart from um, the plans, we've also um, uh, developed a national emergency response operation center under the disaster management and mitigation unit. We've also enhanced uh, climate uh, information services under Zambia Meteorological uh, Department. So you may be asking the National Emergency Operation Center, the climate data uh, based management system that we've uh, created under meteorological, what is the connection uh, with infrastructure, climate re resilient infrastructure? The connection is that um, these platforms generate a lot of uh, useful information. Uh, Alexandra spoke about data and anal analytics, and that is exactly what these platforms actually do. So they generate a lot of information that we use to inform design of infrastructure. So where we've su suffered damage, as we build back better, we ensure that we use uh, that information to come up with better plans. And where we are rehabilitating, coming up with greenfield uh, infrastructure, we again use this information to ensure that the infrastructure we, we, we come up with is actually climate resilient. Uh, next slide, please. So for you to know that your sector plan policy or strategy has mainstreamed uh, climate change fully, you need to use some tools. And one tool that we've developed um, as Zambia is what we're calling uh, screening guidelines for sector policies, plans, and strategies. So what this tool uh, does is that it has benchmarked. We've looked at the SDGs, the 10 uh, climate uh, change related SDGs of the 17, there are 10 of them. We've also looked at our national development plans. We've picked out all the strategies that are contributing to uh, climate change. We've looked at our national uh, policy on climate change. We've even looked at um, the nationally determined contributions. So we've used all these documents to calibrate the screening uh, guidelines. 
uh, that we use against uh, uh, all the, the, the tools that we measure. So the beauty with this tool is that we, each strategy, each plan that we screen, it will actually show where the gaps are and we're able to get back and ensure that those gaps are addressed. And at least at planning level, you are assured that uh, climate change uh, is fully mainstreamed in these sector plans, policies, and strategies. So the screening guidelines have really uh, helped us uh, a lot as, as, as Zambia. Uh, next slide. So we've also used the uh, screening guidelines to screen particularly the infrastructure uh, strategy. Uh, and once we did that, it was able to show us exactly where we needed to improve um, uh, on that particular document. For example, in as much as a lot of work has been done in the road sector, but uh, buildings, um, the energy sector, there's still a lot of work that we still need to do to ensure that even those pieces of uh, infrastructure are made climate resilient. So in the road sector, we've made uh, quite some substantial uh, progress. We've revised the standards and codes of practice. Uh, we had a lot of work that was done uh, in that, which has led now to revising uh, uh, the standards. And uh, using improved hydrological and morphological modeling uh, in the sub-basin, particularly the, the Kafua sub-basin, we're able to use that information to design the road that we've put up uh, there. So the other thing that is very important, uh, once the design standards and codes are reviewed, is that the key players in the sector, the consultants who come up with these designs, the contractors who actually uh, put up this infrastructure and the regulators need to be trained in these new areas. And that is exactly uh, what we did. We, we took all the consultants, contractors and regulators through this training and they are all aware of the revised uh, design standards and codes. It's also important to ensure that uh, on the procurement side, the bidding documents reflect uh, these climate resilient standards in the road sector, and that is exactly what we've done. And uh, the good part is that we've seen even new projects, for example, we have a new project, improved rural connectivity project supported by the World Bank, where these lessons from the work we did have been incorporated and uh, the new revised uh, standards are actually being used on uh, the new infrastructure. Uh, next slide. So when it comes to other infrastructure, particularly the small community infrastructure, it is very important that we always plan with the communities, not planning for the communities, for them to appreciate some of the climate resilient parameters that are factored into the designs. So it's important to ensure that through the gender sensitive climate risk assessment processes, we carry the communities along so that they're able to appreciate why certain uh, variables are incorporated into the design. It's very important. Uh, when we're looking at uh, climate resilience, there is a temptation to focus on the brick and mortar, on the concrete, on the steel, forgetting the soft but critical aspects of uh, climate resilience. So the community structures, such as the canal user committee, uh, committees, the world development committees are very important because once we carry them along, even before we dig the first foundation, and they appreciate the variables, like I mentioned earlier. They become watchdogs for future infrastructure. If there's a departure in future infrastructure that is set up from the standard that is climate resilient, they'll be able to pick that and say, this is moving away from the way we should be doing business if we are to ensure that climate is uh, uh, infrastructure is made uh, climate resilient. So citizen engagement, in other words, is very, very important uh, for us to also have 
uh, climate resilient uh, infrastructure moving forward. That is where I end my presentation. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, John. And I think it was really uh, good that you brought in the whole pro question of community engagement um, there, because I think one question that we had in the um, chat box, uh, the question box did relate to the question of in engaging communities. But John, before you leave, uh, if, if it's okay for you, um, I would just like to ask you, uh, apart from screening the infrastructure strategic plan, can, can I also ask you what other policies you've screened using the tool that you've mentioned in your presentation? Yes, thank you, uh, Noel. Yes, so apart from the infrastructure strategic uh, plan, we also screened the agriculture, the second agriculture policy, uh, which also has a component of uh, infrastructure when you look at small irrigation schemes. So we did screen the second agriculture policy. We also screened the integrated water resources uh, management plan, which also has uh, a component uh, of infrastructure. So those are the two other uh, uh, policies that we screened. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, John, and uh, really interesting work uh, on the ground from you. Um, can I come back to, uh, to our presenter uh, from Bangladesh, uh, Swarna? Um, can I ask you what would be the key areas to bring Bangladesh to the next level in terms of resilience-centric programming, design, and delivery? Um, so thank you. Uh, Bangladesh, it has done quite a lot uh, in, in reducing the vulnerability, but there are a lot of uh, risks that still remain. And so if I were to think of uh, a key area to uh, bring it to the next level, one would be uh, strengthening the operation and maintenance um, of all the existing uh, natural and also man-made uh, structural and non-structural assets, because this really is a foundation uh, for resilience. So investing in operation and maintenance, uh, prioritizing it. So you have these key existing assets that uh, provide these kind of um, essential services to the communities, protect the communities uh, over against these hazards, but over a, a longer time and is much more sustainable. So you, you have a much more longer horizon in place. And then also thinking through about how the government has made uh, a, a plans in, in this space as well through this Bangladesh Delta plan, uh, about 0.5% of the GDP should be allocated for uh, operation and maintenance and seeing how you can move forward with these kind of plans and really implementing those. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, um, Swarna. Um, there's, I want to bring in um, Nisha, if that's okay. Uh, there's a question that's come up in the in the chat question and answer section, um, and this is specifically for the WRI, and I know you're replying in the chat, but I think it's relevant to everybody, and, and I also have opinions on it. <laughs> um, here it's um, the question from Debashish Paul Chauvra is how developing countries can incorporate adaptive design options um, in this tool, considering that all these countries may not have the financial capacity to invest for higher design period, for, and, uh, up to 100, 200 or 300 years, but as well as at the same time to, to ensure that these tools will have flexibility to adapt in the future changes. Uh, given t the anticipated climate change projections. N Nisha, I'll let you respond. Sure, and I'd love to hear your question or answer too to that. Um, but I think maybe just as I was typing, one of the things that um, you know we're very aware of is obviously developing countries are at, uh, do not have the resources to address this issue, not to be honest, neither do developed countries, I think, given the scale of what we're seeing. Um, but I think what we should still push for is this longer term planning uh, approach, right? So if even in the 50 year time frame, um, the fact is that we need better planning and better understanding and analytical 
analytical prowess for us to understand what the priorities are. And at this point, I think we're still at this, um, at this juncture of not understanding fully what climate risk impacts are on the infrastructure network as it stands, as well as if we were to um, build out the infrastructure. Uh, network. So I think even if there's no financing yet, I think it is pretty important for us to understand what the priorities are such that if um, that I think without without the prioritization aspect, I don't think we know where to channel or to signal to even private investors uh, where they could be investing, right? So if they if we are touting blended finance, we are touting public private partnerships for infrastructure, we still need an understanding of where the good where planning um, is pointing us. To as to where the priorities are. So I think um, I think that's one part of the solution. The second piece around the fact that climate change projections are changing and such is that one of the reasons we developed a dynamic tool is that data on the other side is actually easily updatable. So the right now the tool in Jamaica, for example, has a backend which is on actual open source uh, GitHub, I believe is what they use to develop the tool. It's open source tool where you're able to update the latest projections based on the government's sort of understanding of what they what scenarios they'd like to plan for. So that gives you the flexibility to not reinvent the wheel every single time. It's not a static assessment. It is that you are able to see the different scenarios and its impact on the infrastructure network. And you're also able to update, say, your census data or other community data that you might be using to understand how infrastructure is actually used and accessed, such that you're also able to integrate that into your planning going forward. So it is not something that you're making investment for in the next two years, but this is something that it's a long-term planning tool. And we're actually working with the Planning Institute in Jamaica to do this, such that it actually informs economic development plans, whether this is uh, on the infrastructure side, whether this is on the treasury and management side of where should we actually invest. Um, so trying to figure out the right stakeholders and actors in actually developing this was part of, I think, um, our challenge, as well as our contribution, which I think even Swarna and Alexandra and Shanfu and others are working with, we're all working with the sort of the trifecta of, of agencies that we need to, to understand how do you actually change long-term processes rather than the short-term side. So. I will stop there, but happy, Noel, for you to also answer yeah, this. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think it's, Nisha, thanks a lot. Um, I mean, I think it's one of those questions that you can't afford not to, uh, because um, for me, one of the biggest um, opportunities from this kind of analysis is that we have the opportunity to avoid future risk. Um, and that in the increased number of people, the increased number of assets that will be at risk in the future particularly in countries and cities where we have a still large migration from urban to uh, from rural to urban context. So uh, avoiding investment in floodplains, avoiding investment in future floodplains and in coastal areas, I think all of these um, are, are, are really significant opportunities. Uh, so so uh, really important. Um, Alexandra, just maybe uh, if I can give you two minutes to share um, uh, some of the lessons that you feel you took away from the Tonga process? Yes, sure. Thanks, Noel. So I think um, it's a little bit of a truism, really, but um, I think the, the assessment has underlined the need for, for these types of exercises to be demand-driven so that the questions asked and, and the, the way that the answers are given and expressed, the metrics that are chosen address the information needs of, of the key stakeholders. I think so far we're, we're faring quite well because uh, the government is, is actively following up on, 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 on the assessment has taken ownership uh, and, and we'll watch this space in the future to learn more lessons as well. Um, the second point I would like uh, to make, and this is uh, in relation to what Nisha highlighted in her presentation, which is the whole issue of network modeling. So for us, this, this was a pilot. And also in, in terms of the specific questions that were asked, we have focused at the asset level. It allows us to make predictions about service continuity. Um, but in future assessment, we would like to move, and there's a real demand for this as well, to include uh, indirect losses, uh, losses and economic impact. 
So, so the lesson here is really, there is no blueprint. Um, as we discussed with other countries in the region, we adapt the scope on the focus and ultimately uh, the approach and the methodology that we use. Thanks. Thanks uh, very much, Alexandra. I'm afraid I am being outspoken by uh, Barack Obama here in the background in Glasgow. So please, um, if you hear sounds in the background, uh, that, that is my competition today. I'm, um, uh, I'm, it's been a super interesting discussion and I think we could talk for a long time, uh, but I think the main thing it's opened up for us is this uh, importance of collaboration and importance of bringing a lot more conversation um, uh, uh, on, on the work that we're all doing. I'd like to hand over now to Shihon, who will close today's um, uh, uh, session for us. Thank you very much, Shihon. Thank you, Noel. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to join this uh, distinguished panel of speakers. I am honored to provide some closing remarks. Uh, there is a great deal of information and knowledge. I will not attempt to provide a summary of the presentations and discussions. Instead, I will share three takeaways from the interventions today and also in the context of the ongoing COP. Uh, first, on the need for climate resilient infrastructure finance. As you have heard from the presentations, the climate investment funds working with the MDBs has been an early mover in addressing climate adaptation and resilience. Climate resilient infrastructure investment constitute about two thirds of the total PBCR funding, and it has mobilized additional resources from the MDBs and the beneficiary countries. However, $700 million is minuscule relative to the daunting challenges faced by the developing countries. So scaling up climate action and climate finance is urgently needed to meet the challenges, especially for the world's most vulnerable countries and communities. Needless to say, this message squarely resonates with this ongoing COP, as well as the past COPs and the voices of the countries and the multilateral development banks. My second takeaway is investing in climate resilient infrastructure is good business and good investment. It is interesting to hear our colleague from ADB talk about the concerns over their investments in Tonga as a starting point for paying attention to climate risks that later on led to investing in resilience and adaptation. Investing in climate resilient infrastructure is about avoiding asset losses, saving lives, and safeguarding livelihoods. Why then is it so challenging to channel resources to investing in resilient infrastructure? This is a question posed by the moderator. And I was really glad to hear the presentation from Nisha shedding some light on the uh, barriers and potential solutions. My third takeaway is climate adaptation. This is particularly in the context of the COP. Climate mitigation and adaptation need to be better integrated. In the world of climate negotiations, mitigation and adaptation are often separate building blocks. Similarly, in the world of climate finance, mitigation finance and adaptation finance are tracked separately while balancing them is even a stated goal of some climate funds. We need to realize that good mitigation projects should be good for climate resilience and adaptation. And conversely, good adaptation projects should be good for climate mitigation, especially in the long run. When it comes to climate finance, the adaptation versus mitigation dichotomy is not conducive to a system thinking and integrated approach. I hope this event has helped in some way in redirecting our thinking and shed some light on the benefits and importance of taking an integrated approach to financing 
infrastructure, and climate resilience. With that, I thank all the speakers, the audience. Uh, excellent job, uh, uh, Amel, for organizing this. And I hope we had uh, more opportunities uh, to discuss this very important topic. Let me turn to uh, Noel to end the session. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Thank you very much, Yihong, and apologies. It's my hand up rather than um, turning off the camera for some reason. Okay. Um, yes, I think uh, Xihong has already uh, said thank you to everyone, um, particularly to Amel for all the arrangements today. Um, I know there's a lot of um, chat um, that we have here. So there's been some sharing of um, links, uh, introduction to another session that's just starting here um, at COP on, on the Jamaica work. If you wanna kick across, at 2.30, you can watch that uh, live um, on YouTube. Um, uh, I know colleagues from Tonga will be uh, launching the work with uh, uh, the Commonwealth uh, sometime later this week. And we'll also be working with the Resilience Hub on it on Thursday. So um, super exciting. And uh, hopefully we can uh, continue to push on and all learn from this uh, the work that each one of us is doing uh, to, to move, move this agenda uh, quite quickly over, over the next year to, uh, to uh, really grow investment pipelines uh, that can attract larger uh, funding on adaptation with, with co-benefits co in, in, in mitigation. So um, thank you. For, I know everybody's rushing off to other events. So thank you very much. And uh, to the team at SIF and the World Bank, uh, much appreciation from ADB and to all our speakers. So uh, out from us in Glasgow. Thank you. Thank you, Noel. All the best to everyone. Thanks, everyone.